very good. Wonderful. So, Michael, tell us about a little bit about this instrument. Oh, it's very old. It's older than me, even. That takes some doing. 1869. Designed by the, the uh, head of Broadwood at the time, Henry Fowler Broadwood. And he developed what is now the standard in grand pianos. He developed a metal plate that goes over the rest pin plank. In most older pianos, one sees the rest pin plank itself, but as designs improved, so that was covered to give the pin more support. The pin, the rest pin. More support, because there's terrific tension on each and every individual pin. Well, Henry Fowler Broadwood, he went one bit further. This pin plate has the holes in it, as one would expect, to take the rest pins, but the holes are tapped. That is, they've got a thread in. And the, uh, the tuning pins, perforce, have to be threaded. Hold a small second, I'll find one that hasn't been used yet. And you can see, here they are. That one's got the, the hole in the wrong place. Anyway, this is an oblong pin, not square, as currently in use, but oblong. So you have to have a tool, a tuning hammer, with an oblong hole in it, which is what I have here. I had to have this tuning hammer. Um, can't knock these pins in. I had to have this specially made. You can see it's not square, it's oblong. And so tell us something about what we've been doing with this instrument. Well, first of all, uh, we had to prepare it for restringing. Now, that's our big job. The action, you see, is not in here. The action is out on the bench there. And one of the things we had to do, essentially, uh, was to take all the hammers off and send them away for recovering. And that wasn't exceptionally easy. With modern pianos, each hammer assembly comes apart separately. With this one, there's a whole group of hammers with but one centre pin going through the whole lot, instead of each one having their own individual flange, which holds the pin, the, the, the hammer, and its own centre pin. No, it's got one centre pin goes through the whole lot. The same with this one, that's a, a large amount to go on one pin, and there's the last one is even bigger, even longer. But they're a very simple action, these. Broadwood were renowned, renowned for not only the way their craftsmen built their pianos to last. I mean, here is an example, isn't it? It's 1869, over 100 years old, 150 years old, and rising, <laughs> as it will do. So they built them to last, and they're still lasting, and it's, it is that that has made it worthwhile to restore this piano to its former glory. And it will. It'll probably sound a bit strange uh, to the modern ear, not like a Steinway or, or a Beckstein, uh, but a Broadwood. They concentrated on sound the sound that the piano could produce. They weren't terribly interested in the action. Their, their uh, pianists may have said things about that type of thing at the time when, uh, when they went to play these French pianos, the play and uh, so on. 
which had a, a, um, a more modern action developed in 1832, I think it was. Uh, but Broadwood went on using the same action from 1795 to 1895. And this is 1869, so it has the same old action, a very simple one. What happens? You press the key, the hammer comes up, but there's only one little bit of action between that end of the key and pushing the hammer up. That's it. So that means it's very responsive. Well, I think you have to get used to them. Now, you mentioned the sound. Yes. What about this soundboard? I mean, it's, a, it's, you know, 150 years old. Well, this soundboard is in remarkably good condition. There's not a split in it. It's still got the crowning. Um, uh, what do you mean by the crowning? The crowning is that the surface of it is not absolutely flat. It comes up, it bellies up like a violin, a cello, uh, to the bridge and then goes down the other side. So the bridge, as in a cello and violin and viola and double bass, the bridge is on the top of the hill, as it were, and it's able to produce amazing sounds. This is something that uh, the piano industry took over f from the uh, stringed instruments, you know, the violins and violas, the Cremonese, the Cremonese people. And so we've just got two new strings in it. We have indeed. It's just after all this time got its first voice. And that's a long resonance, isn't it? It is. It's very it's, long resonance. It's still going. Oh, yes. I don't say if you put your ear to the frame, you'd be able to hear it. Yeah, we can still hear it. And if you tap the soundboard... So... Very live. We don't talk about Stradivari of pianos, but this isn't bad for 1869. No, we talk about Broadwood pianos, and this is a genuine example. It even says Broadwood on it, and the dates when it was tuned. 1897 is marked down here, 1895. The previous tuners didn't um, mention that they'd been. But this is number 475. A cottage grand. For the purpose of everything being correct, and uh, I have developed a piece of wood with three screws. Uh, well, that used to be a, a music desk um, pin, and, and that was a screw, that's all. However, the purpose of this is to make these hitch pin loops identical. So, first of all, we have to thread it. And then, bend the string carefully and precisely around that pin. That will be the hitch pin when it happens. In the case of Broadwood, this is going round twice. Some manufacturers make it only go around once. Maybe it saves string, I don't know. So there we are, that's the beginning of it. The next part, the next phase, is a bit more complex. I have to carefully bend this tail around the actual string twice and close to each other. The windings must be close. And having got it that far, the next thing to do 
is to bend this tail up toward the loop. And then, and this is pretty thick stuff, this string, as you can see, it's steel, and it's 48 thousandths of an inch thick. Fortunately, these are good cutters, just like that. And to cinch everything tight, if it's not already tight, Yeah, that's it, and then we put it on. As we go up the piano, so the strings become shorter and also thinner. The gauge changes. There we are, that was in place, and now I have to hold it in place. Oops. And because this is a, a very strange beast, this particular type of piano um, and with threaded rest pins if it needs pushing in further you can't do it with a hammer like you can with modern pianos no <laughs> you have to take proper remedial action and so because it is so precise one has to measure the amount you're going to keep of extra string it didn't hurt did it and now it has to be threaded underneath the damper through the agraph, which is there, the first hole in the agraph, up, and then we pull it tight-ish. Come on. Oh, that's why I couldn't see. And then prepare to put it in the hole which is in the pin by bending a certain amount of it round. Next thing is to pull the string back again so that it's ready to go in the pin, which is down here. I can't see it, but there we are. can't see the hole. Undo it a bit, huh? That's it's it. going in. Wonderful. Right, now having got it there, it's essential that the coils be close to each other. String three.
So, Michael, can you tell us a bit about these strings? Yes, they came from Germany, from Gregor Heller, who also supplied the strings for the Betsy, the bass strings, that is. We are replacing them because the original ones were from 1869, and we're using, for the most part, the original rest pins, but we had a problem. These rest pins have got threads on them, and some of them have got rusty over the years, and two of them actually broke off. Now, because they're threaded, it means that we couldn't actually put any old rest pin in, and so I had to get some Bechstein rest pins of the right diameter and the right length. It didn't matter about the length as long as they were long enough, and uh, put threads on them, and then we had to drill through this metal plate here and tap it. So that is what we did, and we've been successful. Here are the two new rest pins. In fact, all the bottom ones I replaced with Becksteins. So, and they seem to be going on all right. And so these base wires, it's not just a matter of uh, it's not just a matter of replacing the base wires, they've got to be twisted as well. They have indeed, because uh, there's a covering on them uh, which is secured at each end, not all the way down, just at each end. And so what we have to do is to ensure that the coverings, which are helically wound on them, uh, copper over a steel core, uh, a pulello steel core, uh, ensure that the windings on them, or coverings, remain secure. So we have to, once I've got them in place, to take them off the other end, off the hitch. You notice that the, uh, the coverings on this, unlike any other piano, go all the way from one end through the bridge right to the hitch and inclusive. The hitch loop there has got part of the copper covering on it. Anyway, we have to uh, ensure that they... What was I going to say? I can't remember. That they remain twisted and coiled, stop them rattling. <laughs> twisted and coiled to stop them from rattling, yes. Sounds like us. That's, uh, yes, how I rattle on. We're very fortunate to have your help. Thank you very much, Michael. Oh, delighted, delighted. It's going to be exciting to hear this instrument again. Well, it certainly is, at least to, to hear it, really hear it. You used to play it, didn't you, as a boy? I did, I did, but the hammers were terribly, terribly worn. <laughs> they so, were flat. Yes, they were flat. Like so, the piano. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's going to be really exciting to hear this. Thank you yes. very much indeed. Delighted. Some people have been asking me about Broadwoods. And so uh, I thought it would be interesting to do a video about this 1869 Broadwood. Um, here, as far as maintaining the instrument is concerned, um, dealing with original instruments has very much changed my approach to tuning and uh, technique on modern instruments. You'll notice that these tuning pins are oblong. And as a result, one has to have an oblong uh, lever. Now, there's quite a, I'd call it a fashion, established thought that one should tune from the 12 o'clock position um, when tuning modern pianos. But I find that really awkward and I don't get um, the uh, greatest control over the tuning pin. So there's another a school of thought that says one should only use a T-hammer because this provides a purely rotational force on the pins. But Broadwoods have these uh, oblong pins, which means that you can't hold your tuning lever at the midday position. You have to use it at whatever angle the pin wants you to use it. And as a result, uh, naturally, 
I use a technique where I will, if I'm pulling a string up, for instance, um, I will pull with this part of my hand, but push with my thumb so that I counteract the vertical movement on the pin. And so as a result, one can use this sort of technique on historic instruments without fear of enlarging the holes. There's another fashion for levers, which I don't like, which puts the, puts the uh, arm of the lever at quite an angle. And yes, this is an oblong one. Um, and this can be useful when one's at the edge of a, an instrument. So in using one of these levers with that uh, high angle, um, I believe that when moving things in that direction, I believe that one's more likely in pulling that way to get a leverage on the tuning pin in that direction and so enlarge the hole. I think that it's easier to control one of these levers, which is much more at 90 degrees, um, and then one can really apply that force properly to counteract the force that's lateral rather than rotational. So those are complications about tuning an instrument with, with uh, these uh, oblong pins. But uh, this uh, rest plank has iron above it and the pins are threaded into it. The earlier broadwoods had straightforward wood and it's there that one's actually got to be much more careful with these uh, lateral forces. Now looking at the action, the action's pretty strange, um, to modern eyes anyway. It's the same action that had been used for more or less the previous hundred years. The regulation is done by inserting slips of cardboard into underneath the top here. So it's in two heart, two sections. Um, this section has the hammers and that bar, and underneath has the jacks that come from the keyboard and then push up underneath the back of the hammer. So there you can see that jack. Now it's kept forwards by the felt on the face of the front of the hammer there. If you take this off, all of those jacks simply go back. And then one would think that it's heaven's own job to get them into place so that you can put the top section of the action down. That's the purpose of this board here, which is screwed on. So this board isn't an ornamental cover. This board is the tool that enables one to push through there all of the jacks forward. So by inserting this board into there, before we put the hammer section down on top, um, we can get the jacks in the right place and there is a locating pin here to locate this in the two positions. So that position is the position for pushing all the jacks forward and that position is the storage position. And that makes these instruments really simple to maintain, provided the felts on the underside of the hammers are in good condition, well maintained and even, then the action is more or less self-regulating. Ah, oh, we can take this lot off and here we see the jacks. Here we are. Let's take all the hands off, all in one go. Being very clumsy and of course, right. don't worry, they'll all go back on. So 
So here we see the jacks. So there you can see how the jacks come up to push the hammer and these levers um, adjust the set off so that it adjusts the height of the hammer before it falls back in the string. Let's take this forward and here you can see the way in which this board moves all the jacks at once in order to get the hammers back in and this top section of action back on. So it's a really, really simple system. It's very effective and that was why Broadwoods just didn't change for the whole of a century. So here we can see when we press the note, it pushes the jack up and pushes the hammer up. And here, there, you can see the set off, which adjusts the extent to which that is forward. And on an inclined slope, adjusts the let off on the hammer. So it's a really, really good and simple action. No, very few moving parts, utterly reliable. Now, putting the hammers back in, there's the rod that goes through joining the whole lot of them. And you can see that that goes into that groove. So what one has to do is to make sure that the whole lot are pulled back to sit in that groove. If this plate doesn't go down properly, it's possibly because some of the hammers have slipped like that. So provided that's in the groove, the whole lot is virtually self-regulating. Um, and in order to adjust the spacing here, perhaps we, there is a small amount of play that we can use along here in order to move them along. But essentially, the whole thing is well adjusted properly in the factory in the first place in the course of manufacture. Another tip with these actions is that um, play is taken up by inserting, so play at the top of the key, so there, is taken up by inserting washers in here. So here I put a couple of uh, keyboard washers into there uh, that just takes up the extra play and this was done on another Broadwood piano I've seen uh, worked on by Alastair Lawrence, who's the head of Broadwoods. So this is the right way to deal with this sort of action.